Uh, thank you for tuning in, everyone. This is a different type of live stream than I have ever done before, and it is the first time that Therapy Talk has gone on live. So uh, very cool indeed. Uh, I am the junior co-host here, it's fair to say. Uh, the real man uh, with the plan, so to speak, is Dr. Michael Edelstein, who is the co-author of Three Minute Therapy with David Ramsey Steele, who's not joining us tonight, but I'm sure he will be back in the future. Uh, Michael, uh, if there's anything you want to say about anything at all, please go ahead. Yes. Um, well, the uh, main purpose for these podcasts is the book, Three Minute Therapy, uh, that I co authored with David Ramsey Steele, who will usually be on with us and published by Gallatin House, and the owner of Gallatin House is Robert Wenzel. Uh, another preliminary remark is since many of our viewers may be new either to the podcast or to REBT, I'd like to give a 30-second background of REBT, which is Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, the subject of the book, Three Minute Therapy. And this was developed by Albert Ellis, a genius in the field, um, it calls REBT, and it has two basic premises. One is our emotions come from our thinking. So we, we, a situation occurs, we think about it, and then if it's an evaluative thinking, some form of good or bad, it creates an emotion. So that number one, our thinking comes from our emotions. And number two, when we have disturbed emotions or destructive behaviors, uh, it also comes from our thinking, mainly in terms of absolutes, demands, must, should, supposed tos, have tos, awfuls, terribles. So once you know that, you're on your way to understanding rational emotive behavior therapy and three minute therapy. Very, very interesting. Uh, the whole concept, of course, of three minute therapy is to train people to provide therapy to themselves, which phases out the uh, psychologist, which I find fascinating. You would not expect a psychologist to uh, try to help people make him or her irrelevant, but that's what this is. Uh, and before we, I guess, uh, discuss this any further, uh, would you mind talking about that a bit, Michael? Yes, uh, what Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, RABT, provides are methods, concepts, and tools that you can use with yourself to uncover and diagnose your emotional or behavioral problem, assuming you have one, and then it gives you ways that you can, tools, strategies, techniques that you can use to overcome these problems and mainly overcome the problem thinking, which causes psychological problems. So that's it in a nutshell. And by the way, it goes without saying, this is a live stream. So if anybody has any uh, questions or comments for Michael, uh, obviously you would not direct any questions about psychology to me, even though I did do well in psychology in high school. As a matter of fact, I have my uh, academic medal for it around here somewhere. But uh, <laughs> now Michael is the guy you would want to talk to about that. Yeah. So if you have any questions or comments for him, feel free to leave them in the live chat. Of course, reasonable and responsible questions and comments, but yeah. you probably know the drill. So yeah. anyhow, Michael. Oh, Joseph, I wanted to comment on that. Joseph, I think you're very humble and, uh, and modest, but I think if people have questions for you as more of an observer of this approach and of life and i think you're quite an insightful observer of life uh, i see no objection to them i directing questions toward you too well michael is very gracious so if anybody has anything for me that i guess is relevant to my lack of knowledge here please do feel free to drop that into the live chat uh so anyhow michael i think one thing to start off with here is uh uh, comparing REBT to more conventional or well-known forms of psychology, uh, Freudianism comes to mind, but that's not taken terribly seriously anymore by the psychological community, uh, psychologist community, excuse me. Uh, but there are other types of therapy that have come about after the Freudian craze, which probably died off in the early 1960s. Uh, so how does REBT stack up against other forms of psychology? Well, 
other forms of psychotherapy, I assume. Precisely, that's what I meant. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the answer is it depends on which orientation to psychotherapy you're referring to. There are actually hundreds, hundreds of different therapeutic approaches that attempts to help people with their emotional and behavioral problems, but there are a few main ones. And uh, the one that's becoming more and more popular these days is called cognitive behavior therapy or cognitive therapy sometimes. And there are variants of that. And cognitive behavior therapy is an offshoot of REBT. Uh, so Albert Ellis started it all with REBT and cognitive behavior therapy is, is a form of that. And REBT incorporates cognitive behavior therapy. And um, one of the main difference, there are a number of differences. And if you get uh, our book, Three Minute Therapy, you'll see in the index is a comparison of cognitive behavior therapy and rational motor behavior therapy. I'll mention some of the differences. The book, as I mentioned, is Three Minute Therapy. And you can go to Amazon. And a good way to get there is to go to the R-E-B-T dot life. It's not dot com or dot org. It's dot life. The R-E-B-T dot life. That will take you to our Amazon page where you can purchase a book. So one of the main differences between cognitive behavior therapy and R-E-B-T is R-E-B-T tends to be a philosophical system where it's a, it gives you methods to actually change the way you look at the world, look at yourself and look at other people. Um, it, it gives you a new pers philosophical perspective. And that is that the, it has a few main aspects. One is there are just us imperfect humans. There are no gods or devils. They're just imperfect humans. Some people do better than others, but everyone is doing things, living their life as best they can. So when someone is depressed or angry, normally they're either condemning themselves, putting themselves down or putting someone else down. But uh, if you look at reality, you don't see gods and devils walking around. You see humans, some are acting uh, very well, wonderfully, some are acting egregiously bad, but uh, it's their actions, not their essence. And then another uh, aspect of REBT is the idea that nothing is the end of the world. There's no heaven or hell in your current life. Now, if you're religious, you may believe that you're going to go to heaven or hell, but REBT deals with the present. And right now, you're neither in heaven or hell. But when you're depressed or escaping, uh, trying to escape harsh reality through addictions or procrast procrastinating, it's often because you believe life is hell. And uh, so you have to escape. But there's just uh, the world. There's good in the world. There's bad in the world. But again, it's a global evaluation. The world is all bad. I'm going to be miserable forever. Life is hell, those kinds of things. And that does, if you look around, you don't see hell. You see people acting badly, or you might see tsunamis and hurricanes, but you also see sunshine, people acting nicely. So there's good and bad in the world, and there's good and bad in all of us. Whereas, well, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, whereas cognitive behavior therapy teaches more granular methods to analyze your thinking. Uh, like, are you doing mind reading? In other words, do you think you know what someone else is thinking about you? Or are you overgeneralizing? Are you taking a bad thing and convincing yourself it's even worse than it is? Um, or are you are fortune telling? Are you predicting the future when you uh, don't have a crystal ball to do so? So that's, that's good, and it helps people. But REBT gives you this overall general philosophy. Uh, Joseph, did you want to say something about that? 
I was going to say, there is the perspective that I don't need therapy. Uh, therapy is for weaklings or for people who uh, burn their money, stuff like that. And any problem I have, I can resolve on my own, even without something like three-minute therapy that would teach you to do just that. Uh, what do you have to say about that perspective, Michael? There definitely still is something of a, a stigma against therapy in many quarters. Yes, and even if there, even where there's not a social stigma, and that's certainly diminishing people create their own stigma. This, as you said, I'm a weakling, I'm a basket case, a nutcase. If, um, if I'm going for therapy, I should be able to solve my own problems. Well, there are a number of problems with that kind of thinking. One is uh, there's no such thing as a weakling or a nutcase. That's the kind of overgeneralization that I was speaking about earlier. There's just us imperfect humans who maybe have irrational ideas about certain things or act weakly at times. But if you act weakly, that can't magically turn you into an, a total weakling. You're just an imperfect human who acts strongly at times and acts weakly at times. And similarly, on the other side of the coin, you can't be a strong person. You just are an imperfect human who does well at times and does poorly at times. And if you have that outlook, you'll understand yourself better and you'll understand others better. You'll understand your motivation and their motivation better. And uh, did you want to comment on that, Joseph, before I go on? Uh, no, go on. There, There is something in the live chat, but I will address it as soon as you're done. Oh, good. Um, now, in terms of I should be able to do this on my own, a should is one of those absolutistic uh, musts or demands, shoulds, musts, supposed tos, have tos, got tos, that uh, come from strong preferences. I strongly prefer I would do this on my own, and therefore I should, I have to, I must, but there's no evidence why you should or why you must, especially since you're an imperfect human who acts imperfectly. And so at times you won't do what you strongly prefer to do. You strongly prefer to get over illness and pain and injury. And uh, you can go so far to resolve that yourself. But sometimes you might decide it's time to go to the doctor. And usually you won't decide you're a weakling or uh, a physical medical basket case because you're going to the doctor. So if you have that kind of saner attitude toward uh, seeing a therapist, that would make a lot more sense. On the other hand, there are people who do it on their own. So they do better in the rational thinking department. That doesn't mean they're a strong person. It just means that they do better in some areas of their life than in other areas of your life. You could always compare yourself to someone who's doing better in a particular area of your life. But uh, the best thing to do is to try to resolve it on your own. Read Three Minute Therapy and read the 80 books by Albert Ellis. And uh, that will go a long way to helping you on your own. And then it's not a disgrace if you call on a therapist. Billy Jean asks, weaklings don't exist. And that's a question that I think most people would probably ask because the idea that people can't be strong or weak uh, would likely seem, I guess, absurd to the average Jack or Jill because some people have an ability to deal with the, uh, shall we say, harsh realities of life. They're more resilient than other people are. So to say that a weakling doesn't exist would seem to go against what one sees in the world around you. Yes, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Billy Jean, uh, because it is a common misunderstanding. And what you're really saying, Billy Jean, is that because you do well in some areas of your life, in the area of resilience, in the area of emotional st stability, that's the total you. But there's no evidence it's a total you. Sometimes you screw up, sometimes you get anxious if you're human. <laughs> so uh, so you're, again, you're a flawed human who acts well in some areas of your life, maybe in most areas of your life, uh, but you're still imperfect. You might do well today with resiliently or for the last year, but then I'm sure sometimes you 
uh, don't do that well. Maybe you're fatigued, you're sick, you're not thinking straight. Um, so again, it doesn't make sense to, to paint humans with that broad brush at bottom. And I can't say this enough, we're all imperfect humans who act imperfectly. And the solution to that is accepting yourself unconditionally, whether you do well or poorly, and accepting others unconditionally, whether they do well or poorly. And that doesn't necessarily mean you like what they're doing. If someone punches you in the nose, you don't like that normally, but you can still unconditionally accept them. They're human not like their behavior, dislike their behavior, try to get them to stop or keep away from them, but uh, they're still imperfect humans. There are no gods or demons on this earth. And if anybody else has any uh, questions or questions, excuse me, or comments, please do leave them in the live chat and we should be able to get to them. These are not very long. The episodes uh, will be up at eight. So uh, please do get your question or comment in sooner than later. Uh, but anyway, I think a lot of people would think that on the whole, if I'm strong enough to deal with, you know, such and such a problem, then I should be able to deal with another problem just because I'm strong enough to deal with this other uh, issue. Uh, but uh, that doesn't work out uh, all the time, to, to, to put it kindly. Uh, so how would you approach this perspective, Michael? Yeah, great question. Uh, that you know, this, I guess, uh, people believing that things should not be compartmentalized. That's right. That's a very good question. And you sort of gave the answer there, Joseph. And that is the people tend to, <clears throat> excuse me, they tend to compart compartmentalize their skills, their abilities, their emotions in different situations. So I've had clients, for example, that were very reasonable, got along well at work, and they didn't get along well at all with their families. And I've had other clients who don't do well in their family situation, but they don't get along well at work. Uh, so that's the way people are. Uh, there are people uh, like myself who I modestly think I'm a great therapist, but when it comes to finances, you know, I don't know my my elbow from my wrist. So, so, uh, and and I think that most people are like that. There may be some people who are great in some areas, but I doubt it. I, I think we could always find areas that they're not very good in and uh, some areas they are good in. Uh, and uh, an obvious reason why you can't say someone's no, not good in any area is because if they're alive, they've been good at keeping themselves alive. They didn't walk in front of a truck. They didn't fall out a window. They didn't accidentally eat poison. So they're good at keeping themselves alive. So they, they do at least one good thing in their life and probably many, many more. Does that answer the question about compartmentalization? It does for me. We have uh, yeah. other questions here now. One from James Butler. What do you think about derealization? Well, uh, it would be useful to know what you mean by it, but I have an idea. And derealization means that at times you feel everything around you is not real, you are not real. Uh, sometimes it's called depersonalization. And uh, it's uh, people feel that at times. And uh, if you, and the issue is, are you? disturbing yourself about that. Uh, often it, that feeling comes and goes, but you can still operate in your life, even if it uh, seems a little, life seems a little distant from you. But if you're anxious about it, or if you're depressed about it, and you think, I must not experience this, this proves I'm crazy, then you have a must there, which tends to magnify it, and then you're more likely to feel it more. And as we've been discussing, there are no musts, there are no shoulds. It may be lovely if you never ex experience derealization or depersonalization, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, you can still uh, considerably enjoy life, unconditionally accept yourself, others, and your 
derealization and move on with your life. So uh, James, if you want to write back and let us know why it's a particular uh, emotional problem, then we could help you with that too. By the way, Joseph, I did want to mention that uh, Joseph and I and David would like to invite you to come on this podcast and discuss a personal problem it's like anxiety, depression, anger, relationship problems, addictions, procrastination. I'm sure none of our viewers ever experienced any of that. <laughs> but if uh, you would like, to discuss this, or even if you have a friend or relative who has these problems and you'd like to help them, you could come on. We'd love to have you, and I think it would make an interesting podcast, and it would be a great way to illustrate rationally motivated behavior therapy. I will just be here to comment and provide, I hope, some at least semi-interesting dialogue. Uh, there, but... there goes Joseph, humble and modest again. <laughs> just... By the way, that, that raises an interesting issue. Uh, Joseph, I don't know that much about your personal life, but it's my impression from what I know about you, you're fairly sane and emotionally stable. Uh -huh. And I think that if you are, I think you have a reasonable view perspective on life and you certainly could explain how you see life and how you see yourself and others when things go poorly to someone who has problems and that could be a great help to them which is another interesting aspect of rational mode of behavior therapy in some way you can say it's common sense and uh, people who had problems and got over the problems on their own sometimes figured this out for themselves common sense, and they see uh, some of the insights that we teach in REBT, and I suspect you've figured some of those out also, Joseph, and you certainly could impart those to others. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I shall try to share any uh, nuggets of wisdom that I have. I, obviously, from a layman's perspective, I'm not a psychological, uh, a, a psychologist or a mental health professional, but I, I do uh, thank you very much for saying these kind things about me. It's very well received. Yeah. Just well, don't, and when you're helping others, as long as you don't call yourself a psychologist or a therapist, then you won't wind up in jail. You could, <laughs> you could call yourself uh, someone who does reasonably well in navigating life. How about that? <laughs> That's very good. Yes, we'll go with that. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I would never want to be thought of as impersonating someone. Uh, anyway, uh, or a profession, I should say. Not a, This wouldn't be identity theft. It'd be more like professional theft. And definitely right, exactly. not into that. <laughs> uh, a blog of the West asks, thoughts on the work of Ernest Becker, both theoretically and in your practice? Uh, I don't know much about Ernest Becker, so let me take a stab at it. If I recall, Ernest Becker is the one who, a psychologist or author, who wrote about death. And he said that uh, the biggest fear people have is the fear of death. Now, in my book uh, that I co-authored with Nick Berry, we called Stage Fright, how to get over public speaking anxiety and public performance anxiety. We dispute that. And it's our findings that the major fear people have is the fear of public speaking, uh, even more common than the fear of death. But assuming that Becker is right, the fear of death is the main fear people have. Uh, the question is, well, what's the solution? And Albert Ellis's rational motor behavior therapy uh, gives you a solution. And that is first, if you have a fear, that's an emotion. And now we know that our emotions come from our thinking, our views, our attitudes, beliefs, and particularly musts and shoulds. So what is the demand you have that about death that causes your fear? And normally it's something like, I must not die or I absolutely must know what's going to happen when I do die, or I must be healthy and not get sick and avoid death. Um, I must avoid a slow, painful death. So although these goals to avoid a slow, painful death and to uh, avoid death entirely are, are admirable goals, they don't create the fear. 
the fear is created by our demands about death. So when you have a fear or you have anxiety or panic or stress or depression or anger, that's a red flag telling you, look at, look for the must, look for the should, and then question it, challenge it, and contradict it. Tellmaster207 says, getting spoiled with another live stream. Thank you. You are welcome, Tellmaster. He also says, uh, or she, I have anxiety due to being sick to my stomach watching the market crash. You're not alone. <laughs> You're definitely not alone. Yeah, it yeah. is uh, a dumpster fire, to say the least. James Butler uh, says, I suffer from panic disorder and have dealt with derealization from time to time. I've heard the comorbidity with panic disorder and derealization is about 50%. Have you read about Paul Bloom's theories of empathy? And if so, what do you think of his conclusions? Well, we have a lot of questions in there. And of course, I have answers to all of them. Uh, and Joseph, do we have time to deal with these or shall we start? With uh, the well, the only time? real question was from James and uh, that would... Uh, the, 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 that 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 that's pretty much I think all that would would be would yeah we will go a little over uh, eight o'clock but that's okay with me but uh, sure if you just address what James asked I think that'll be fine. Okay, there so was, there was one about market crash. Uh, let me start about that fear of market crash. I don't think that was a question. I think that was just more of a comment. That was, okay. the, 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 so the question was James. Uh, James I have a, Butler. a comment on the comment. If, sure. if we're going to go over. I'll make it brief. Sure, please and go that ahead. that is if you have fears or nausea, which is a manifestation of fear and anxiety about market crash, again, it's a red flag, to look for your demand. What's my must? What's my should? That's causing my fear. Now, the solution is, to, is not, not to care and say, who cares if the market crashes and I have no money and I'm on subsist subsistent uh, <laughs> life and income, uh, that's not the solution. The solution is to show yourself there are no musts, there are no shoulds. If the market crashes, all you get as is disadvantages or great disadvantages, not hells, not uh, demons chasing you with pitchforks or things like that. So give up your musts, the market must not crash, and look at the disadvantages, which are real, and figure out how you can best deal with the disadvantages. Okay. And then, uh, Joseph, you had a question. You had another question from James. Is that it? Yes. And I'll read you. He had a comment. Well, I'll read you the question and the comment because they both go together. Uh, he says, I suffer from panic disorder and have dealt with derealization from time to time. I've heard the comorbidity with panic disorder and derealization is about 50%. Have you read about Paul Bloom's theories of empathy? And if so, what do you think of his conclusions? Okay, well, those are two different questions. One about the depersonalization and panic, and the other is Paul Bloom's uh, empathy. Um, let me do, take the second one first, and then we'll see if we have time for the first. And Paul Bloom wrote a book called Against Empathy. Uh, so he's against empathy because he thinks it leads to certain behaviors that he doesn't like, and they may very well be bad. But he's missing uh, the major cause of, e of, of actions. And that is our actions are not caused by our emotions, like empathy. So if people are empathic and then they act in ways he doesn't like, uh, it's not the empathy that causes it. It's their thinking. Remember the basic guideline here, our actions and our emotions come from our thinking. So he's uh, barking up the wrong tree here. It's not the empathy that's the problem. It's the thinking behind the actions he doesn't like. So that's the thing to think about. And uh, he's defining empathy in a somewhat idiosyncratic way. Often empathy is defined by the, the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand what they're feeling, in a sense, feel what they're feeling. And it doesn't force you or... Uh, mandate that you act in a certain way once you have empathy. 
Uh, as a therapist, I think it's important that I have empathy to understand what my clients are feeling, but it's not that in itself that makes me an REBT therapist. I'm sure psychoanalysts, Freudians, uh, all of the Jungians, all of the kind of therapists have some empathy for their clients, but they act in very different ways. So uh, I think Paul Bloom could read uh, my book and David Ramsey Steele's book, Three Minute Therapy, read some books by Albert Ellis. And I think that would put them on the better track in terms of empathy. And uh, there wasn't, there's only one question that James asked, but he did make the statement about uh, his panic or uh, that he suffers from panic disorder and has dealt with derealization from time to time. And he heard that the comorbidity with panic disorder and derealization is about 50%. Uh, do you have anything to add uh, to that, Michael? Yes. Again, uh, let's uh, come up with the basic premise. If you have panic, it's not about your experiences of depersonalization. The panic is about, guess what? You're thinking, your must, your shoulds, the supposed tos, have tos. Albert Ellis used to say, sure she le must, sure she le should. When you're uh, panicked, anxious, uh, disturbed emotionally in some way, look for the must, look for the should, and then show yourself musts and shoulds are fictions like Santa Claus, they don't exist, all that exists is our strong preferences and desires, passions, not demands, not musts and shoulds. There are no laws of the universe that you must not experience this uncomfortable feeling of depersonalization. Uh, by the way, James, if you have further questions about this, please save it for our next podcast. And uh, Joseph, David, and I will be happy to answer it. I wanted to remind you, to uh, read Three Minute Therapy, get it on Amazon. And there is one last thing uh, from Bazakotron. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll read it. It's one question. Uh, it's a comment, but it has a question in it. Uh, I think a brief one at the end. Yeah, go ahead. Bazakotron says, my friend had pursued an overarching lifelong 20 plus year set of goals. And now after some soul searching, finds the aforementioned goals hollow and meaningless, having experienced a sort of sea change in philosophical outlook. Lacking a theological framework seems to have plunged him into a myopic pursuit of hedonism with a dash of despair. Any thoughts slash solutions? It's not me, I swear. <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah, and I'll make it brief, uh, but if you want to ask the question again, ask me to elaborate more next time, I'll do so. And that is, there's two types of hedonism. There's short-term hedonism and long-term hedonism. Long-term hedonism means putting your major life goals first and your short-term pleasurable goals a close second. Don't kick them out entirely. It's good to get immediate pleasure at times, but it's a matter of uh, priorities and uh, how you rank the importance of each. So hedonism itself is not necessarily bad or self-defeating. So the, the question is, is this, uh, is this person's hedonism sabotaging his major goals? And if it is, then we could call that a short-term hedonism addictive uh, or compulsive behavior. And with addictive or compulsive or impulsive behavior, guess what? Look for your must, look for your should, and question, challenge, and contradict them. And there are no musts and shoulds. If you'd like further elaboration, tune into Therapy Talk in the Future or read uh, one of Albert Ellis's books, E-L-L-I-S, or uh, read Three Minute Therapy by David Ramsey Steele and me, or you could go to YouTube, put in Michael Edelstein, REBT, and you'll see many videos of podcasts, talks I've given, debates I've had about various aspects of REBT. So that, or you can go to my website, three minute therapy.com, three is spelled out, and there's much rich material uh, available to you at no charge to learn more about this and the details. 
This has been an excellent episode, Michael. I have enjoyed it. I hope that everyone watching enjoyed it as well. Uh, Obviously, this was a live broadcast, but I think virtually everyone will wind up seeing it, the people who do see it, when it's uploaded to YouTube uh, tomorrow. So uh, thank you all for being here. Bazaar Patron says, thanks for taking the extra time, guys. I'm very glad that we did. Uh, It uh, it was a very good discussion. And... uh, I look forward to the next one. Oh, the blog of the West says, I just bought a used copy of your book on Amazon. It's the hardcover edition with a brilliant purple slash red slash orange cover. I got the right one correct. Uh, Well, there are two. You got the older copy, which is very, very much the same as the new copy, which is slightly different. It's the new copy is soft cover. And also it has... uh, some updating in it uh some of the things examples were changed to make it seem more modern we don't talk about tape recorders anymore or or, uh, things like that and also it has that very important index which compares major differences between rational motor behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy but uh by the way if you want the appendix uh just go to um you Google and write five major differences between REBT and CBT, Michael Edelstein, and you'll get the article, which is the same as the appendix in the new edition. Good stuff. Uh, And thank you for the great questions, everyone. Uh, It took a while for them to roll in, but when they did start rolling in, we wound up going over time. Very cool in my book. Uh, Very glad, once again, that we were able to do this. Anything you would like to say before uh, the show concludes, Michael? Um, I just want to thank you, Joseph, for being a great moderator and for your modesty. Uh, but I'm going to get you over that if I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, it is modesty. I also don't want anyone to think I'm violating the Florida statutes. So two okay. very important very things. Good. Very good. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, take it easy. Thanks for tuning in. Hope that you tune in next time, whether it's live or you're just listening to the recorded version. Uh, it was a great discussion. Have a good one. Bye-bye.